This morning's scripture is Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like, like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But then that servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be, to, to be tortured until he should, should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. So this week we will finish our sermon series on uh, the beginning of being a disciple of Jesus. So over the past few weeks, we have discussed our need to declare ourselves as disciples of Jesus. We discussed how we might define God in our lives and what that means for us. And last week, we discussed the idea of what a disciple looks like and how we need to be looking out for God working in our world. Now, I hate to disappoint you all this week. There will be no costume change uh, prior to the sermon as there was last week. So um, that's probably a one-off thing. No, I'm not going to do it during the sermon. I don't have that ability. Uh, so this week, we're going to discuss what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and how the idea of reconciliation and forgiveness are important parts of being a disciple. Now, when the first disciples were forming as a group, they spent almost all of their time together. Think about the stories that we hear in the Bible, how they traveled around uh, following and learning from Jesus. And these early followers get to see all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing firsthand. How amazing is that? How amazing would it be if we were able to do that, right? Well, truly it is. And we get a great recording of all those miracles and teachings of Jesus. In this group of disciples, what they were, they are truly a community, right? See, a community is a group of people that come together around a common idea. And for these people, it would be to follow Jesus. I'm very thankful that we get the historical records that uh, come out of this community of believers. See, we get the chance to learn so much from them. And we do get a chance to learn a lot about their lives, right? By and large, we know who they were, where they were from, uh, and how Jesus called each of them to follow him. But what we don't get in Scripture is a, a description of what the day-to-day -day life of those disciples would have been like. 
So I have a question for you. How many of you have ever been camping before? And I don't mean you take your camper someplace and you stay in your camper. I mean sleeping outside in tents and having to cook outside, you know, real backwoods sort of camping. And I'm guessing that most of you, if not all of you, have probably done something like that in your life. And I myself do enjoy camping. I think that it is fun. At least I do when I'm only camping for a few days. Because when you are camping in that sort of primitive manner uh, with a group of people, there are problems that can easily arise in that group. See, one thing that camping does not give you by and large is a sense of privacy and personal space. You are constantly surrounded by others in your group. And when everyone is getting along, no big deal, right? When everyone's getting along, it is fine. But what happens when a problem comes up between members of that group? What do you do when you have a problem and you can't get away from the people that you're upset with? You know, John, it was your turn to cook breakfast and clean up the camp today. And I didn't get fed and this place is a pigsty. What is wrong with you? And John says, my turn. It's not my turn. Don't blame me. You're the one who wasn't doing your job. See, things can get really contentious really fast when you spend a lot of time together with others. Just like a family, right? An argument in a family can quickly go from, hey, you didn't do the dishes last night like I asked to. Yeah, well, your mother wears combat boots. Things can escalate quickly because it's hard to live in a community with others sometimes. And the first disciples were doing just that, really. They were a small community, largely living in ways that we would consider today primitive sort of camping. Now, do you think that they ever got on each other's nerves? Do you think that they ever quarreled with one another? I will remind you that some of them were brothers. Any brothers here have ever got on each other's nerves? I'm not looking at two in particular at this moment, I'll tell you. Right? It happens. Part of family is sometimes you get on each other's nerves. And the answer for the disciples is yes, they did. Uh, we actually do get some different things recorded in Scripture about disagreements that those disciples have with one another. It's no different than any other community. When you spend a lot of time together... Sometimes things that are not a big deal can feel like they are. We can find ourselves annoyed by what someone might do or what someone might say. And when that happens in our daily lives out and about, yeah, it's kind of annoying, but by and large, we can simply walk away from those moments and we don't have to dwell on them. Uh, this week, I had someone pull out in front of me in their truck and they were pulling a trailer as well. And uh, they pulled out in front of me and nearly caused a wreck. The person behind me was also following too closely. And I think I've told you all how much I enjoy that on a daily basis when someone tailgates me. So I had to slam on my brakes and pray that the person behind me was paying attention and, and thank the Lord they were. But while I was upset about that for a moment, it's not a problem that I have to dwell on all the time, right? Right. And what I mean is, I'll probably never see that guy again. And if I do, I probably won't even realize that it's him, unless he's pulling the same trailer in the same truck. Now imagine, though, that it had been Carlin that pulled her car out in front of me and nearly caused a wreck. It's not the same thing, right? I see her all the time. And now I'll be tempted to be reminded of that time she nearly caused us to have a wreck. You see, that is unless I am willing to forgive her for doing so. You see, forgiveness is a big part of Jesus' ministry. He talks often about forgiveness. And he tells us how we can have forgiveness of our sins because of the sacrifice that he is going to have on the cross for us. And he tells us that we are forgiven and we should forgive others as well. And we find that in our scripture for today. When Peter asks how many times does he need to forgive someone that sins against him, it might seem kind of random that he chooses the number seven. Why seven? Why not ten? You know, 
if you have any kids in math right now, you know everything is base 10. Got to get to 10. Got to get to 10. So why 7? Well, Peter is actually suggesting something interesting here. Uh, you see, under Jewish law at the time, you were required to forgive someone three times. So three strikes and that person's out of your life forever, right? You had to forgive them three times. And Peter is trying to be extra forgiving here, right? Hey, Jesus, you know what? How many times should I forgive someone? You know what? I'm going to go with seven because I'm going to forgive them twice as many times as I'm required to by law. I'm going to throw one more in there just for good measure. And Jesus, you're going to hear that and you're going to be impressed by what I say. Well, no, Jesus is not impressed by that suggestion of seven. See, he tells them that they should forgive others 70 and 7 times, or depending upon your translation, 70 times 7, depending on which version you're reading. But either way, both of those numbers are much more than 7, right? But the truth is, it's not about the number. That number has nothing to do with it. The point that Jesus is trying to make is that we are to forgive others, period. We're not to keep track of the number of times that we have forgiven them, and we're not to go back and rehash the things that they have done once we've forgiven them. You know, pastor, I don't know. It seems like it's really hard. Sometimes it can be. Being a disciple of Jesus is not always an easy path. And forgiveness is so important to Jesus. He talks about it many times throughout Scripture. The one that I am always reminded of is Matthew chapter 5, verse 24. Uh, Jesus tells us that if there is a problem between us and our brother or sister, even when we are about to give our gift at the altar, that we should stop immediately and go and be reconciled with our brother before we give our gift. So what he is saying to us there essentially is this. If you are going into worship, make sure you are reconciled with your brother first. Now consider how highly that means that Jesus prizes forgiveness and reconciliation. We know that worship is important. And we know that giving our prayers and our songs and our words to God is what he wants from us. And as important as that is, Jesus tells us to make sure we are forgiving others. Because that is important too. To make sure we have done that before we worship. Now, he doesn't say don't go back and worship, right? That's not part of the scripture. It's go be reconciled with your brothers and then come back to the altar. So we as disciples of Jesus, we have to remember that as well. We need to make sure that we are being reconciled to one another. Making sure that forgiveness and peace among us is in order in the right way so that we can enter into worship the right way. And why, but why is that so important? Why, well, if we're following Jesus as his disciples and we're not reconciled to one another and we're not forgiving one another, we're holding on to those hurts that we have, well, how hard is it then going to be to bring others to worship Jesus? You know, you may have noticed, maybe not, but maybe you have, that when I pray during our joys and concerns times, I often say, thank you for letting us come together as a community of faith in order to worship you. That is what we are, right? We are a community of faith. We are a group of people that have come together around the idea of worshiping Jesus Christ, right? We are a community just like those disciples were. So then, if we don't have forgiveness in our own community, it will be difficult for us to take Jesus to others. And I will tell you this, there has never been a church that has existed that was successful when the members were angry with one another. There has never been a church that has existed that was successful when the members were talking badly about one another. You know, Abraham Lincoln is famous for saying, a house divided cannot stand. 
Well, a community of believers divided cannot stand either. Oh, sure, we can plot along for a while. But ultimately, we will fail. So why does it matter? Why does it matter if we fail as a community of believers? What is, it, what is at stake if we do fail? Well, what is at stake is all the good works that we could be doing in the name of Jesus. All the people that we could be reaching with the good news of the gospel. And finally, our own sense of purpose and belonging in the kingdom. I am reminded of our verse from today, chapter 18, verse 35, which is the closing of our scripture today. When Jesus tells the, the parable of the slave not uh, forgiving his fellow slave and the result of that, he tells us in 1835, So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and sister from your heart. So what happened to that slave? He was thrown into prison and tortured to repay his entire debt. And Jesus tells us if we're not willing to forgive our brothers and sisters, guess what? God is going to do the same to us. And he is not speaking to unbelievers here, right? He is speaking to the disciples. He is speaking to the believers here. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, I told you that there's never been a church that's existed that was successful when the members are angry with one another, or one that has existed that was successful when the members were talking badly about one another. Guess what? There has never been a church that hasn't experienced a time when someone was angry with someone else, or someone else had a word to say against another brother or sister. Because communities are hard sometimes. And I'm not saying that we find ourselves constantly in that struggle, but there are times when a church goes through those things. The only way to move past and forward through those is to be willing to forgive one another. You see, each of the things I talked about, doing good works in Jesus' name, reaching people with his gospel and having a sense of purpose and belonging inside our community. Those are great things of great importance. And that is why Jesus spends so much time talking about forgiveness and teaching the first disciples about it because forgiveness is a key component in any community. When you think about your small community, Meaning, you think about your family, right? It's awful hard to be in a marriage if there's no forgiveness. I know that uh, I probably wouldn't be in one if Carlin wasn't such a forgiving person, right? So we have to remember that in our community together. So let us commit ourselves to being a people that are striving to do our best, but also let us admit that we are not perfect and we are in need of forgiveness and let us be a people that are willing to forgive one another 70 times seven times my challenge for you this week is this if you need to be reconciled to your brother or sister in some way do it this week before you come before the altar again amen